I would now like to invite the three panelists to join me uh, on the stage. Uh, Philip, uh, Kaisa and Christina, if you would like to stand over here. Great. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we would like to look at how this post-2015 agenda can be turned into a pre-2030 action agenda. Is there going to be this global transformation that the SDGs talk about and what would we need to change to make that happen? So, uh, we are delighted to have us uh, with us today um, Kaisa Olofsgård in the middle, uh, our Swedish post-2015 ambassador who's been leading the uh, Swedish delegation. And uh, we have Kristina Borge Friborg, uh, head of sustainable business at Sandvik AB. And for all the non-Swedes in the audience, Sandvik is a global engineering company today, nearly 50,000 employees, uh, very established in 1862. Uh, and you produce tools and machinery for metal cutting uh, for sectors such as mining and construction. So, potentially a big impact on industrialization and infrastructure in developed and developing countries. Uh, and Sandvik is also an active member in this uh, network that CEDA hosts, uh, Swedish Leadership for Sustainable Development, uh, some leading Swedish corporations joining there. And finally, we have Philip Osano, our uh, recent uh, colleague at the SEI Africa Center. Um, Philip, before joining SEI, he worked for the African Union Commission on developing an, um, a strategy and impl implementation plan for an African agricultural transformation uh, strategy. So uh, we hope that you can share some experiences from that um, sort of more implementation work at the regional level with us today. So <coughs> I'd like to uh, us to explore a bit this idea of transformation and transformative goals, but first asking you some questions relating more to your specific roles or the context you're operating in. Starting with you, Kaisa, we want to look at implementation, but just if I ask you to look back on the process, has there been Anything surprising in the negotiations? Do you agree that it's a miracle what we have now? <laughs> well, uh, actually, until now, uh, uh, I haven't discovered very many surprises. And um, I mean, that's compared to the result that we had in the Open Working Group, of course. Unfortunately, I was not part of the Open Working Group, so maybe I, I missed some of, of the compar comparison here. But, um, to a large extent, what we have been doing uh, the last uh, uh, five months, or, or uh, from since we started the, in the, the formal part of the, of the process, the intergovernmental negotiations, is building on what was done by the, by the Open Working Group. So we have uh, continued to have this very open-ended, very inclusive, uh, and very kind of, of uh, positioning uh, discussions. Um, uh, that will probably change now with, with the zero draft that we had uh, like 36 uh, hours ago. Uh, that, will, that will be when we will see new formations, I, I, I suppose. Uh, one thing that has surprised me though, uh, I would say there are two things that really have surprised me. And one is, uh, um, you were talking about uh, uh, the the discussions that we had earlier on from, on on the the uh, on the goals on on because we, we thought that we got into the intergovernmental negotiations with a proposal from the open working group but uh, the G77 really sees this as the result of the of the negotiations so that, that is one of the things that have 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 uh, surprised me how keen so many countries are to keep the goals as they are are formulated right now uh, it's understandable, given the, the, the explanation that you have already uh, given on the inclusiveness and the, the, the really impressive process that I was on, the, on, the, on the, the process for the open working group. And I think really we should, we should be careful also about the result. The other thing that has surprised me is the very broad engagement that is out there, that is in the, in the breadth of the Swedish society, that you find in the breadth of the international society. When I go to New York 
uh, the Swedish civil society wants, wants to, they are part of the Swedish delegation to start with. Uh, they want to, to interact very, very directly with me, but also international uh, CSOs do want to interact very, very closely with, with, with the, the Swedish representative. And, one, and, and the other thing is that so many countries have started already to implement what came out from the Open Working Group. Sorry for being a little bit long. Mm. <coughs> Thanks a lot. Just a short follow-up. Do you see, uh, is there any convergence in these approaches to implementation at the national level, or do they approach this completely differently? Uh, there are some convergences. Uh, uh, the countries that have started to, to implement already, uh, things that they do are, are uh, putting more focus on, on coordinating uh, inside governments, uh, the internal coherence of, of, of policies. And uh, another thing that is very clear that governments do is to work very closely with the municipalities and, and other local regions. And this is something that we have found out also in Sweden that this, very, this is crucial in order to, to have a result. And I would say uh, also to engage uh, the whole breadth of society because this is something, and that is understood, uh, I think, quite broadly. This is something that we can neither formulate nor implement uh, on a governmental uh, level. Thanks so much. Uh, Christina, moving on to you. So, uh, how can the SDGs be made attractive? It's a question we heard. And does business have a responsibility in this agenda? And it would be interesting if you comment both as an individual company, but also uh, from the perspective of the Swedish Leadership for Sustainable Development Network. Uh, I would say yes. We, uh, from, from the business, we have been looking for uh, relevant goals for a long time. So when the invitation came from CEDA to take part of this network that you mentioned, the idea was that we would be able to take part of the development process of the new goals. This was one of the success factors. So the interest from the business society is big because the MDGs, or the Millennium Development Goals, as they stand now, are not all of them are relevant to many, if I can put it that way. As an industrial company, and I, 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 I really want to make sure that you don't mis misinterpret me, on me now, but some of the goals are really not relevant for our business. So when it comes to environmental goals, yes, but they haven't been very explicit. When it comes to maternity or, or, or it doesn't really, I mean, we have our internal, but we can't really influence these goals as much as we would like to. So therefore, some of the new goals that are coming up now are much more relevant to us. Mm -hmm. So when I did a mapping, and this is when I speak for Sunvik now, but I think I can speak also for the network, so that when we start mapping the, the, the proposed goals now, I realize that we have been reporting on many of these goals, a majority of these goals, for a long time. You know, since 2007. Mm -hmm. uh, for the natural resources, for example, for the climate change or emissions and so on. We report on these things, we measure them, and we see business. Uh, and that's actually the key, key success for the network, but I think, mm -hmm. it, actually, some, th there was this question earlier here, why would business, business care? Mm -hmm. And my very simple answer is because it's good business. It, it really drives good business. And that's really key. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the way you need to work on these issues. Thanks a lot. Um, so, Philip, uh, you've been working, as I mentioned, on this, uh, I believe it was a 10-year strategy for agricultural uh, growth and transformation that fed into a much bigger uh, and even more long-term process, uh, a development vision for, for Africa for 2063. So, a sort of 50-year time perspective. In your view, can these high-level long-term strategies and goals uh, really steer markets and technologies and, and people's behavior? So, uh, in a way, are they these ins inspiratory uh, inspiration frameworks or action agendas that Nina referred to? No, thank you for the question. Um, um, from my observation, I think um, there's a validity to the fact that these uh, strategies can create inspiration. Um, the reason I'm saying so is um, taking an example of uh, what I was working on. Um, the, the, the strategy, the 10 year strategy for African agriculture from 2015 to 2025 is not a process that started 
uh, last year. This is a process that started in 2003. Um, and it started in 2000, 2003 under the framework of what was called the new partnership, or what is called the new partnership for Africa development. So that is in itself was a vision for Africa to say that as we move towards uh, almost getting to 50 years after independence across many countries. Um, what progress are we seeing and what progress are we not seeing? And can we therefore develop a common agenda for the continent to develop? And insofar as NEPAD was therefore adopted in 2001 by African heads of state, they then moved into implementation through developing specific strategies for specific sector. So in the agricultural sector, uh, they, they adopted what's called the Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program. In, in, in Maputo, in Mozambique, in 2003. Um, so the strategy we've just finished developing um, was actually also reflecting back on the last 10 years of the CADAP. And, and, and there were lessons, two, two key ones were first and foremost, uh, the inspiration that the African leadership gave in 2003 was a dedicated um, commitment to ensure that countries invest 10% of their GDP to agricultural sector. If you look back 10 years, um, 13 countries at one point or the other invested more than 10% of their GDP to agriculture. Four of those which consistently invested and in a smart way had huge achievements in terms of the objectives of making agricultural growth and also reducing poverty. And, and that is Rwanda, uh, Ethiopia, uh, Burkina Faso, and at some, at some period Malawi. So yes, I, I can say that these broad visions, if interpreted smartly and implemented uh, by the technocrats in a well-articulated way, they can inspire transformative change. Mm. Yeah. So, so yeah, continuing on this topic of transformative change uh, and transformation, I think it's uh, to many of us still a little bit mysterious <laughs> what this is. So can you, uh, the th three of you share with us how you think about this. I mean, what does it mean in practice or how would you approach it in your different context, um, in the business context and, I mean, a government, how would the government sort of understand this? Christina, do you see uh, yourself sort of leading transformations or contributing to them? Or I, I think what, what we are doing is stuff that we've been doing for a long time. It's just that we've called it something else. But I would actually like to give you two very concrete examples of how we are trying to transform our business, mm. if I may. Mm. The first one is we speak a lot about circular economy these days. This means that we need to recycle and reuse much more of the material that we, um, that we use. Uh, one uh, material that we use, one, one metal and one mineral, is, is uh, tungsten, Wolfram in Swedish, uh, tungsten. Tungsten is a very finite material. There is about 100 years more in the ground, 100 years more of use in the ground. We have five different um, business areas in Sandvik. Four of them use tungsten. So tungsten to us is a, an extremely important ingredient in what we do. Yeah? So many, many years ago actually, about 15 years ago, we, we realized that we need to start recycling. We need to start used, using more used material, if you wish. So we have started this buyback system. So we buy back used material from our customers, which means that we get a pretty steady supply of material. Our customers don't have to deal with the pretty hazardous material that we're speaking about. And, and we do not dig it out of the ground, which saves us a lot of emissions. It saves us a lot of, well, energy, obviously, which is also cost. So it drives down our costs. Um, and now, with the latest legislation coming from, from the US on conflict minerals, tungsten has is, is now been classified in the US as a conflict mineral, and it may actually be classified as such in, in the European Union as well. We, we get around that because we know the source. Mm. Yeah? So th there's a lot of benefit to this. So we help the customer. It, it's a, a smaller cost to us, and it actually has a positive impact on, on the environment. And in order to increase this, we actually purchased, we, we acquired a company in Austria with, with a, a, a tungsten mine, but also a big plant where we can actually recycle in order to increase the level of recycling. So that's what we strive for. And when it comes to the metal material that we put into the stainless steel that we do, 80% is scrap from the start. 80 mm. percent. This is business to us, mm -hmm. but it's also very good environmental programs. 
Can, do I have time for a, a second yeah, sure example? example. Yeah. Yeah. A very recent one. We, as you know, we produce um, equipment for the mining industry. Mm. So we wanted to develop a new truck, um, uh, sort of a dumpster type kind of truck in Australia. Um, and we did that together with a customer and we listened a lot to the uh, environmental and safety requirements they had and we put in about another 60 different things from a safety perspective. Mm. It, it weighs about five, five tons less and it actually consumes a lot less energy. Mm. This truck has gotten from 15 to about 80% of the available orders on the market in less than a year because of the lesser fuel consumption, lesser emissions and increased safety. Mm. It's good business. This is what I'm trying to... It's, it's really important that you show these concrete examples of we're not doing... I mean, obviously, we want to be a responsible company and so on, but if you want to have a sustainable drive for these issues, you need to find the business benefits mm. where environment, safety and social issues go hand in hand. Mm. So not only the risk perspective. No. Yeah. Thanks for those concrete examples. I think that's really helpful to... Um, grappling with this idea of transformation. But just uh, follow up, um, the time perspective here. So for the SDGs, we have a 15-year time perspective, like drawing on these examples and in general. Do you think that's some sort of a realistic time frame? Is it a good time frame to be working in? Or should we have like more shorter term goals or even longer term ones? It's, that, I think it's a really difficult question for me to answer because in, in, in the business, you know, I think we're a little bit faster sometimes, if mm. I may. Yeah. <laughs> Slightly in politically incorrect here, but I think sometimes it's just easier for us mm. because we can, we, since we measure most of the stuff that we do, um, even the water recycling, we know exactly how much water we, uh, we use, for example, and mm. we do recycle everything in water stressed areas because it's good business, because water is expensive. Yeah? Mm. So, so for us, it, it, it doesn't take 15 years. This truck that I mentioned, it took less than two years. So, so, and, but what, what may take time is actually the development of more such such products, mm. uh, and specifically when it comes to more complicated products. Something that we have a lot of research on is fuel cells, mm. in Swedish, uh, which we, ha we really believe in, and we've spent 10 years of research, mm. uh, of time for that. But now we're getting there. We have found an industrialized way of producing them, which mm. is a breakthrough. So now hopefully it will hit the market. So that's a 10-year perspective, whereas, mm. you know, so, but it's still faster than 15. Kaisa, from a government perspective, you obviously have perhaps less control over markets and resources and sort of doing these transformations. But in, in the sort of initial discussions in, in the, uh, across the government ministries, can you make sense of this idea of transformation or is it sort of just paralyzing or distracting or what's the sense? On an international level, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, uh, yes and no. <laughs> uh, it's obvious that to change uh, the planet is, uh, needs more time than to change the production of, of, of specific items. Mm. And in that sense, of course, 15 years is not, not such a long time. Mm. Uh, I do believe that uh, the process of, of uh, coming together governments in uh, negotiations in New York, but maybe more in, in bilateral meetings and regional meetings among uh, policy makers and to discuss and put on the agenda the issue of, of sustainable development is in itself transformative. Mm -hmm. And it's also uh, necessary for the, for the, the global uh, society to have a kind of framework to, to follow up, to have uh, somewhere to meet, to, to, to discuss the issues and, and uh, need the, the global efforts to, to focus in a mm. way. Uh, that would be one of the answers. The other, uh, the other answer would be that, in a sense, we very often um, uh, like to see ourselves as leaders of, of such processes. But to a very large extent, we are also the servants of a process that is, real, is uh, really going on any, anyhow. 
I mean, this is a, there, there's a big push from the breadth of society to have this change, and there's a big need that has been shown not less by by by, by academic academia. And then we need to to uh, kind of, of gather this 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 push for a change. Mm. That leads on to a question. Um, so I know you have a background in trade. Uh, negotiations because trade could be one of these trade rules uh, frameworks agreements can be an enabling factor or a disabling factor um, and I know some of the SDG targets are actually addressing trade and sort of reforming the system and in particular making it uh, better for the least developed countries but we also hear about this limited progress on sustainability in trade negotiations and we hear about the investment agreements like the TTIP that could potentially undermine environmental regulation. Do you see uh, the SDG agenda and the trade agenda sort of going separate ways or are there, uh, do you see uh, scope for win-win opportunities or at least uh, mm. that they are compatible? No, I, I definitely would say that also the trade community and the trade policy community feels this push from society and uh, uh, the need to, to use trade policy also uh, for, for sustainable development. And there are uh, kind of two aspects in this, of course. It is not uh, inhibiting progress on, on sustainable development. And you're talking about the transatlantic uh, uh, free trade agreement and the specific uh, um, dispute settlement mechanism. Uh, we have heard about a lot of... of, of, of uh, uh, examples uh, internationally, uh, international examples uh, lately that have, have uh, certainly with, the, with these negotiations come into to the common, common uh, discussion. Um, this is a system we have had for a, lot, for a long time, but now it is very much on the agenda mm -hmm. and uh, we're not there yet. But really, I think it's encouraging to see how the European Union, the Commission, and also the Swedish government is very much taking this discussion on board, trying to learn from the discussion. This has really shown the need to, to have a modernized system for, for dispute settlement in the, in the, the uh, bilateral agreements. Uh, we should also remember that, that the bilateral trade uh, agreements are very often used to enhance the dialogue on, on sustainable development. There is not one simple uh, uh, new uh, trade agreement that does not enhance a, a, a chapter on, on, on a dialogue and cooperation on sustainable development. And that's the, then there's the, there's the other part of it, the, the development part, the, the possibility for, for developing countries to, to reap the benefits of, of, of the international trading system. And uh, just as, just as Johan pointed to, they are not so much talking about the, the need for using this for environmental uh, uh, purposes. Rather, there is quite some suspicion among developing countries uh, for us using, using uh, uh, this as an excuse for protecting our own industry or our own agriculture. And they do have good reasons for that. We need to be very cautious mm. when we look in how to using the trading system for... for, for for um, uh, sustainable development, and we need. I think the European Union has has shown some very good examples also when it comes to 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 uh, making our markets uh, available for for the least developing countries, uh, with with the full uh, duty free and quota free entrance for goods, and also being the f first. Uh, uh, more developed partner uh, opening up uh, for the least developed countries also on, on the, in the services sector. We can, there, there could be much more done, mm. but there is a change also in, in, in the trade policy uh, environment, I would say. Okay. Uh, Philip, we talked earlier about the role of technology and transformation, and I think many of us have sort of, uh, read in the media these stories about the technological transformations going on in, uh, in the African region with mobile and ICT technologies. Are there, is there still a lot of potential in that? And could that sort of be um, uh, beefing up the potential for SDG achievements? Um. I think technology is an enabler, um, and, and, and to achieve SDGs, uh, you need many enablers. So 
um, and some enablers facilitate other enablers. So to, 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 to accelerate uh, technology adoption, you need the right policies and the right incentives. Um, when you talk about ICTs, um, you know, 2000, uh, when we were discussing or they're developing the Millennium Development Goals, um, access to internet, access to cell phones, and, and so on in many parts of Africa uh, was very limited. As a matter of fact, I remember reading a research from, um, I think it was IDRC, that was quite shocking. It was saying that an, on average, an African university uh, with about 40,000 students had the same bandwidth uh, as, as, as a household in Europe. That's how bad it was. And, and you expect these people to do research, you expect them to be competitive globally. Um, over time, we've seen a big shift in that, uh, particularly in some countries, Kenya, for example, which therefore created policies that enabled um, private sector to come in, um, um, sort of liberalized uh, the communication, telecommunication market. And the, the, the impact has been phenomenal. Um, um, two weeks ago, the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya was giving a report that says 4% of the country's GDP is traded on mobile phone, uh, mobile phone transactions. Uh, this has really revolutionized life, uh, businesses, small enterprises which were previously um, uh, not doing well, and now you know, people are able to transact money. Um, if you look at farmers that need to market their produce, uh, who are being ripped off by middlemen because they couldn't know what the prices are and so on. Right now, they're able to actually just access prices on their, on their mobile phone and so on. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a role for technology. Uh, the only thing is we need to ensure that that technology isn't uh, one that would also be undermining some of the visions um, that the global society would, would need to have because there are also those kind of technologies. Mm. Thank you so much. We actually need to start wrapping up already, <laughs> but thanks for commenting on this really broad agenda. Maybe in a year's time we can meet again and uh, sort of have a better idea of uh, specific priorities in this agenda for Sweden or for other countries. wanted to end this with a, a question for all of you uh, with some brief answer, if possible. If you could choose one target or issue area, uh, where you would like to see the most progress in the next five years in, or, in order to have a shot at this 2030 big agenda. Which one would it be? Hmm. Christina? Can I start? Yeah. Uh, the one that we haven't mentioned today, which is the governance one, number 16. Um, and I think this is something that we have in common, all the companies that have joined this uh, network. I think we're approximately 25 because it keeps changing, so I don't really know. Uh, we represent more than half of Swedish B GDP, so we are really a strong force. And we are all convinced of sustainable development and we all strive towards the same goal. If we are to be able to expand and grow in the countries where employment and more social benefits and so on are needed, we need governance. We need better institutions, we need less corruption and so forth. So that would be the main topic for us, I would say. Giving us the, the, the basis for good business. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Kaisa. <laughs> I would refuse to answer that <laughs> question. <laughs> diplomat. But really, really uh, what's the novelty, what's the important thing about the agenda mm. is that we take on board uh, all the challenges mm. and try to solve them at, at one time. Mm. And also the balance between uh, the aims, the objectives that we, we, we put, put in front of us and the means of implementation that, that we present. So sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we have corruption, we have all the goals and targets, and Philip, what's your take? I mean, I think I'll go back to the basics. I think the target on poverty, poverty reduction, still poverty. remains as valid as it was. Um, and actually, not just poverty reduction, but in, increasingly we're seeing also huge rising inequalities. Countries, um, you know, developing economies that are, are having very fast economic growth, uh, that's not trickling down, and it's very few people are benefiting, but the large majority actually their conditions and situation are getting worse. So I think attendant to that is the need to, for inequality, um, attention to inequality as well. Yeah. Very good. Thank you so much. Warm applause.